Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Sabine Zirke, as all of you know, and on behalf of the uh, North American Studies Program and the German uh, Canadian Center, I'd like to welcome you uh, warmly to the next to last event uh, we have in our lecture series, Current Issues in American and Cultural Studies. Let me briefly announce an additional lecture uh, that we have added to our program. We have another guest on the 10th of, 10th of July, um, uh, a philosopher from uh, Australia, uh, Michelle Boulos Walker, who will speak on the topic uh, slow philosophy in an age of haste, what are universities for? She has written a book on the topic of slow philosophy. And I think we're ending this term in this way on, on a little reflective mode. Um, we all uh, sense that, uh, or, or it appears that time is accelerating. Of course, it is not. Uh, but um, uh, we will reflect a little bit on what we're actually doing here. And you can go on reflecting over the summer then. So this is on the 10th of July, our last, our last uh, event. And I'm just going to pass around um, the, uh, the, the flyer for the, for the event. Um, but for tonight, I'm really, really happy to be able to welcome our guest, uh, Professor M Michelle Mart. Um, um, when Professor Mart proposed that she would talk about nostalgia, I thought this is a wonderful idea. Uh, and I think we didn't talk about this before. I don't know whether you knew that we have been working for a couple of years on nostalgia and, and retro. And um, so this, um, this, seminar, uh, this lecture really lands in a context uh, that is well prepared for. We have a Fulbright lecture this, uh, this uh, summer, uh, Professor Lily Gorin, who also lectured on nostalgia and the making of modern America. She has also been teaching uh, seminars on nostalgia, and I myself have been teaching uh, a course on nostalgia and retro. So it was the per perfect uh, proposition, and I thought, bingo, this, this is wonderful. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Michelle Mart before uh, we hear more about her current research. Michelle Mart uh, is an associate professor of history at Pennsylvania State University at Penn State's Berks County, uh, County campus, halfway between Philadelphia and the state's capital of Harrisburg. She teaches classes on American foreign policy and environmental history, and particularly uh, um, on the 1960s and the Vietnam War, the Cold War, as well as American involvement in the Middle East. Her current research may, for the biggest part, be located at the crossroads of post-World War II American culture, the environment, and foreign policy. In addition to teaching and her own research, Dr. Marit is also engaged in larger research communities. Uh, she is a member of the Committee on Research, Scholarship and Academic Relations at the Harry S. Truman Library Institute and a member of the American Jewish Historical Society uh, Academic Council. She also serves as a peer reviewer for the journal Diplomatic History, the European Journal of American Studies and the academic publisher Roman and Littlefield. Michelle Mart is an alumna of New York City's prestigious Hunter College uh, High School on the Upper East Side. She graduated from Cornell University in upstate New York with distinction in all subjects and with various honors. She then received an MA from the University of Michigan, where she majored in American and Soviet, and Soviet studies and a PhD in history from New York University. Her PhD thesis at NYU entitled Pioneers, Prophets, and Pragmatists, American Images of Israel and Jews, 1947 to 1960, was advised by Marilyn B. Young, a leading scholar of the Vietnam War um, and of U.S. foreign policy in general. Dr. Murray went on to work as a lecturer at Tufts University in, near Boston and Cambridge, exactly. No, Somerville, right? Tufts is in Somerville. Is it some of them? No, no. Uh, <laughs> Never mind. It, it's outside the city. <laughs> Never mind. Okay. We'll, we'll find out. <laughs> it's uh, near Boston is still yeah. correct, right? <laughs> and she lectured there for two years before she joined Penn State Berks in 1995. She has, 
has since given presentations and lectures all across the United States, as well as in Jerusalem, Granada, U U Utrecht, Krefeld, and Erfurt, to name just a few of her past destinations. And now we can add Bonn. We're happy, very happy about that. Her first book, based on her dissertation, was entitled I on Israel, How America Came to View Israel as an Ally. Um, was published with uh, State University um, of New York Press in 2006. Dr. Mart's long-standing interest in, in American Jewish history and the development of U.S.-Israeli relations is also reflected in a series of articles written for edited volumes and academic journals such as Diplomatic History, Religion and American Culture, Modern Ju Judaism, or Studies in North American History, Politics and Society, on topics such as Eleanor Roosevelt, Liberalism and Israel, or Jews in 1950s American popular culture. After her book, Eye on Israel, was published, Dr. Mart began to focus her research activities on environmental history, which ultimately led to the publication of her second book, P uh, Pesticides, A Love Story, America's Enduring Embrace of Dangerous Chemicals, wonderful title, I think, which was published uh, with the University of Can Kansas Press in 2015. Michelle Mart's interest in the subject appears to have been sparked to some extent at last by a reconsideration of Silent Spring, Rachel, Rachel Carson's 1962 pioneering study of the effects of indiscriminate pesticide use in the United States. As Dr. Mart wrote in, two, in a 2010 article for Left History, Carson's book, and I quote, contributed to a new cultural understanding of the human place in the natural world, as well as polit policies to clean up the environment. Rachel Carson does, and I quote again, deserves credit for being the good mother, God godmother of the Environmental Protection Agency, the ban on DDT and other pesticides. Earth Day, the 1972 federal in insecticide, fungicide and rodenticide act, and indeed of environmentalism as a philosophy and political movement, end of citation. Quite appropriately, Dr. Mart was a fellow at um, the Rachel Carson Center for Environment and Society, that is at um, an institution at the Ludwig Maximilians Universität in München, uh, in Munich. Mm. In uh, 2012 and 2013, as well as in 2014. Now, currently, Dr. Mark is working on a book length study on the intersection of food, politics, and culture. And it is her research on these matters that we will hear more about tonight. As she argues in the abstract to her talk, many of today's so called foodie movements are seeking, and I quote, seeking to recapture food cultures from days gone by through local and organic production, artisanal uh, spe specialities, and reframing food as both, both central and pure. And in this way, I may add, such movements imagine a time that never was, and they also feed to us a time that ne never was, and that is really interesting to reflect uh, upon, uh, because these uh, times and these foods sell uh, uh, increasingly well. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hear more about food nostalgia and the search for pleasure, rethinking what we eat. And um, please welcome with me, Professor Mart. Much for that uh, extensive and kind introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be here this evening. I love to talk about food. I love to talk about ideas that I'm working on. Uh, and I very much appreciate that the university asked me to come this evening. And I appreciate that the University of Erfurt invited me to be here this summer so I would have the opportunity to come to Bonn as well. In the next hour or so, uh, I invite you to join me in thinking about something that is so natural and necessary that we often do not give it much thought, what to eat. Sometimes the simplest questions can be the most daunting ones. At the start of the 21st century, many Americans and other Westerners wrestled with this question, what to eat. That the question was even posed 
testified to the age of abundance spawned by more than a century of industrial agriculture. And it's hard to criticize such abundance. But in the wake of the mountains of cheap food, there have also been serious environmental, health, and cultural consequences, which pushed some people toward the seemingly simple dilemma, what to eat. The question masks a much more serious revolt underway among a small segment of the population, going by a variety of names, the new food revolution, the local food movement, the farm to table movement, the slow food movement. The new approach to the raising, procurement, cooking, and eating of food at the end of the 20th and beginning of the 21st centuries called for a wholesale change to what Americans ate. Such an ambitious agenda begs the question, what drove the pockets of passionate dissatisfaction with the food status quo? Was it nostalgia for a bygone age and the food associated with it? Or was it a desire to self-consciously create a new modern food system, blending old and new methods, fusing cuisines, fusing cultures? Moreover, was the new food movement driven by pleasure-seeking among selfish elites or by less hedonistic motivations to repair the environment and human health? In the next several minutes, I will argue that these goals were not mutually exclusive and thus pointed the way to a multifaceted new food system that could meet different cultural, environmental, and health goals. But even while acknowledging the complex interaction of goals at play in the new food movements, my concern this evening are the two cultural goals which stirred the most criticism and the most backlash nostalgic yearning, and the search for pleasure. Before turning to the new food revolution and its goals, it makes sense to think about what people were rebelling against. Industrial agriculture in the United States had begun to reshape food systems and cultures as early as the late 19th century, and the early success of industrial farming rested on several foundations. First was the Western expansion of the nation, facilitated by a growing railroad network, which helped certain regions to specialize in particular commodities, such as wheat in Minnesota and the Dakotas, corn and pork in the Midwest, and dairy in Wisconsin and Iowa. It was not too long before large corporations um, built a growing industry to exploit the increasing quantities of commodities that were available for falling prices. Uh, and these, of course, are some advertisements from this early period and these new products. Historian Harvey Levenstein describes just how quickly this new industry was created, writing that by 1900, 20%, one fifth of the nation's manufacturing was in food processing. That's huge, really big. The growth of food processing increased even more quickly with the increased demands of production that stemmed from the First World War and then from the Second World War as well. As in many areas of the American economy, the two decades after World War II are often viewed as a golden age of agriculture, at least of industrial agriculture. Building on the technological and business innovations of the early 20th century, agriculture was transformed with the civilian adaption of synthetic petroleum-based pesticides, such as DDT, which had been developed for military use. A cursory look at the transformation of post-war farming bolstered popular faith in human ingenuity and the new technologies, both mechanical and chemical, as grain, dairy, and animal production on farms just skyrocketed. Americans not only celebrated ballooning production, they also reveled in the processing, which turned raw material into modern foodstuffs. Along with the dramatic increase in agricultural output, acceptance of mid 20th century food man manufacturing had been laid decades earlier with the introduction of factory foods and what was called scientific cookery 
in the late 19th and early 20th century. Scientific cookery stemmed from the ability to isolate the components of food in the laboratory and to determine the necessary requirements for growth and good health. One source of such knowledge uh, came from within the U.S. government, and it's this man here, W.O. Atwater, and his research within the Department of Agriculture of the government uh, set up the system, the framework of nutritional understanding, which then will be used for the rest of the 20th century. Uh, the Department of Agriculture issued guidelines of what Americans should eat to keep them healthy, largely based at first on this man's research. At first glance, understanding the nutritional elements of various foods and what humans biologically require to stay healthy appeared to be a laudable goal. But laudable goals can sometimes have unintended consequences. Historian Laura Shapiro observed that these technological and philosophical changes of scientific cookery reshaped taste over the next century as well. She wrote, quote, nuances of flavor and texture were irrelevant in the scientific kitchen and pleasure was sent off to wait in the parlor. Another inheritance of the scientific cookery approach is what writer Michael Pollan labeled nutritionism, or the idea that food was merely a collection of nutritional components. For some, the obsession with nutritional components seemed to supplant culture and destroy the authority of culinary traditions. In addition, the idea that food was merely a vehicle to ingest particular vitamins and amounts of protein led to the assumption that nutritional elements could be simulated in the lab or manipulated in factory foods. Thus, food became divorced from the earth and from its particular environment. All of these elements then, nutritionism, scientific cookery, increased agricultural output, and widespread food manufacturing combined to create the American food system, which then dominated the 20th century and determined what Americans would eat. By the late 20th century, a number of Americans, especially those who embraced environmentalism and wanted to reconnect with the natural world, expressed dissatisfaction with the idea that food was a mere nutritional commodity and produced by modern technology, not nature. Dissatisfaction with industrial food also grew for health reasons. By the 1970s, there was increasing evidence that despite decades of viewing food through a nutritionist lens, increasing numbers of Americans were succumbing to food-related diseases. This proved to be fertile ground for a countercultural approach to food, which included the adoption of unconventional and Eastern-inspired cuisines and, su and support for organic foods raised outside of the conventional system. The new food revolution of the late 20th and early 21st centuries grew from these strands of rebellion and collection of ideals. Um, and at the top there, you see a photo from one of the early food co-ops from the 1970s, which were set up by individuals to bypass the industrial food system. The movement in its various guises sought to replace the existing industrial food system with one of less processed, fresher foods produced without pesticides and without other chemicals, attempting to turn back the clock on the globalization of food, which shipped commodities thousands of miles. The movement celebrated local foods and relationships with producers, which anchored foods in particular places and particular seasons. This rethinking of food aimed to repair the environmental damage of industrial food and to restore human health, which had been damaged by it. Such goals were, of course, made more urgent by the accelerating crisis of climate change. The industrial food system, as it had evolved, 
was both a demonstration of economic and technological success manipulating the earth and the unthinking exploitation of the environment which characterized the Anthropocene. A challenge to the food status quo then was far more ambitious than it at first appeared. Alice Waters challenged the food status quo. She was one of the leading figures of the new food revolution, helping to reshape contemporary attitudes towards raising and consuming food. She cared deeply about how food was raised and our relationship to agricultural lands. She cherished beauty and aesthetics in food and the way that it was prepared. In 1971, she founded what would become a world famous restaurant, Shape Nice in Berkeley, California, and thereafter advocated for the new approach to food practice there. I'm, I'm curious among the students, how many people have heard of Shape Nice? Has anyone in here heard of it? Okay. Well, then this is all new. <laughs> uh, it's, it's still there, but um, I, probably most of us cannot afford it. No. <laughs> uh, this is the uh, front entrance of Chez Panisse and their open kitchen after a fire had destroyed it originally and they rebuilt the inside. And by the way, the distinctly un-American name Chez Panisse, was a reflection of Alice Waters' love of French culture and French cuisine. And Waters named the restaurant after Henri Panisse, who was a, a character in a Marcel Pignol film trilogy. And that's, that's why I got that name. Over the years, Chez Panisse and Waters influenced many chefs, many home cooks, and restaurateurs embraced her model and her ideals. As chef and food writer Ruth Reichel observed in 1989, Chez Panisse, quote, changed the way America eats. Over the years, Chez Panisse also changed. It began as a challenge to the bland, processed taste which dominated American cuisine in the mid-20th century and, and also reflected the communal ideals of the counterculture by creating a collaborative, extended family among the staff and the neighborhood patrons. The restaurant was communal in structure, not just ideals. It was founded by Waters and six friends, and in the early days, in the 1970s, Waters was not always prominent in the press coverage about the restaurant. For example, in a 1979 article in the Chicago Tribune on, on this big annual festival that Chez Panisse had on garlic, a garlic festival, Waters wasn't even mentioned in the article because it, it was the restaurant. Along with celebrating communalism, from its earliest days, taste was an essential goal at Chez Panisse. While always emphasizing good tasting, fresh quality ingredients, the restaurant came to focus more and more on using very local foods produced by small farmers by organic methods. The style of cuisine and menus evolved over time, moving from simple French market food to adventurous, eclectic, French-inspired haute cuisine, to new American recipes based on the foods of Northern California. While staying true to its communal spirit and fostering experimentation, the reputation of Chez Panisse evolved within the food world, drawing visitors from far and wide, including President Bill Clinton in 1993, and earning the widespread accolades of food critics beginning with its first review in Gourmet Magazine in 1975. By 2001, Gourmet had named Chez Panisse the best restaurant in the United States. The cultural and social impact of Chez Panisse has been great. But Waters always made it clear that she was motivated by sensual exploration, not abstract goals. For example, writing about what she termed a delicious revolution in 2007, she asserted, quote, I was searching for flavor, not philosophy. Further, in encouraging people to take up cooking, she told her readers, quote, 
It's the many dimensions of sensual experience that make cooking so satisfying. Water's descriptions of the sensual experience of food were at times more obviously sexual, such as seeing, quote, a lovely unblemished apple just picked from the tree as voluptuous, or a beautifully perfect pear as sensuous. I, I cannot help but conclude that the criticism of Waters and other new food, men, uh, food movement adherents as, as selfish or shallow was further encouraged by such metaphoric sexualized language, but there it is anyway. In encouraging people to take up cooking, Waters told her readers to, quote, enjoy cooking as a sensory pleasure. Touch, listen, smell, above all, taste, since, quote, it's the many dimensions of sensual experience that make cooking so satisfying. In many of her recipe and other books, Waters emphasized the importance of how food tastes more than anything else and the importance of the ingredients used. One more quote from her, she said, what I really want is a restaurant where you just give people good bread, good wine, good olive oil, and then you lead them to a wonderful garden and you say, there it is, help yourself. Others were inspired by such an injunction to help yourself on the farm. Chef Tom Caliccio followed in Waters' footsteps in his craft restaurants, which first opened in 2001, which emphasized the simple pleasures of quality ingredients. And he's the gentleman over here. He asserted that he wanted to focus on food as craft, not artistry, and simply highlight great unadulterated foods. Chef Dan Barber, the man with the sheep, uh, asserted that a, quote, true primal taste would indicate that food was grown in the right ecologically sound way. So the pleasure of taste would lead one to healthy, a healthy environment and a healthy body. My point, quote, said Barber, is that you don't have to be an environmentalist, you don't have to be a nutritionist, you don't have to be anything other than somebody who just seeks good tastes. Another leading figure in the new food movements focused, who also focused on pleasure was Carlo Petrini, here with Alice Waters, who is the founder of the Slow Food Movement. Slow Food is an international organization dating from the late 1980s, which encourages the preservation and celebration of local and traditional food cultures. Uh, and it's, it's in Germany, it's throughout Europe, it's throughout the world, there are slow food movements in many places now. In his celebration of traditional food cultures outside of the industrial food system, Petrini believed that pleasure was essential in any challenge to the politics of the food system. Celebrating the sensual pleasures of food led to one of the most common criticisms of the new food movement and the participants sometimes derisively referred to as foodies that it was at its core selfish and shallow, a precious exercise of elite consumption inaccessible to most people. For example, writer P Michael Pollan observed that Petrini's emphasis on pleasure was probably the reason that some people didn't give slow food the respect that it deserved. The increasing cost of dining at Chez Panisse also led many to criticize Waters' pursuit of pleasure. Even back in 1979, one newspaper article briefly observed that Chez Panisse was, quote, patronized by the Berkeley, California elite. Not wanting to compromise on the gourmet quality of the restaurant, Waters tried to address the issue of access by opening a more affordable cafe upstairs from the main restaurant. Affordability, though, is relative, and the cafe might still have been rarefied to many. 
Such judgments point to a challenging question. Can the consumption of food be both noble and satisfying? Waters so certainly thought so. Petrini thought so too. And Pollen thought so as well. As much as Waters wrote about pleasure and sensory experiences, she also built Chapinese on the idea of local traditional food cultures and how food connected us to the land. For instance, the Chapinese Cafe cookbook included descriptions of the farmers, fishermen, and other purveyors on whom the cafe relied to encourage readers to seek out, quote, such dedicated stewards of the land in their own areas. In 2004, she told an audience, if we can educate the senses and break down the wall of ignorance between farmers and eaters, I am convinced, because I've seen it with my own eyes time and again, people will inevitably choose the sustainable way. Seven years later, she continued to emphasize the importance of this communal and environmental impact. Quote, our vision at Chez Panisse has always been a world where delicious food enriches the celebration of life and strengthens our connection to nature and culture. In the decades since Chez Panisse opened, Water's philosophy evolved as she asserted that the pleasurable was political. Food writer Kim Severson summed up Water's belief as follows, quote, the most political act we can commit is to eat delicious food that is produced in a way that is sustainable, that doesn't exploit workers, and is eaten slowly and with reverence. Along with Waters, other restaurateurs established mutually beneficial relationships with farmers and then identified them on their menus, sometimes in elaborate prose, which eventually became the source of parody by critics who, who skewered the descriptions as pretentious. In addition to the wholesale suppliers and restaurateurs, the desire of many Americans to build relationships with small farmers was also reflected in the increased subscriptions to CSAs, or Community Supported Agriculture, in the early 21st century. Estimates of some farms numbered several thousand in the United States by 2015. In CSAs, people pay money to the farmer before the season starts to invest in the farm, and then they get a share of the produce throughout the season from the farm. So they have a relationship with this farm. Many individuals reported their satisfaction in getting to know the farmer and where the food came from. And the desire of many ordinary consumers to feel connected to farmers was also reflected in the practices of corporations, including the wildly successful natural and organic supermarket chain, Whole Foods. Whole Foods stores posted lists of purveyors who supplied their food, sometimes including detailed portraits of the farmers. Such powerful cultural ideals are ripe for exploitation in the narratives created by Whole Foods and other corporations. As Michael Pollan indicated in his criticisms of what he labeled supermarket pastoral. The yearning for connection with food suppliers was one of the clearest illustrations of the nostalgia which seemed to permeate the new food revolution. Many Americans look back to a simpler age when small family farmers had dominated the country. Far from being just an expression of modern dissatisfaction, the agrarian ideal, of course, had had a powerful hold on the nation's identity since its founding. Thomas Jefferson's dictum that those who work on the land are the chosen people of God remained a bedrock of American culture long after the vast majority of citizens had left the land for other types of employment. From her kitchen at Chez Panisse, Alice Waters wanted to lead diners to an experience of the past that was both individual and communal. She wrote, I want people to share the excitement of good things, beautiful foodstuffs, and if I can see that people are receptive, then something wonderful happens. Time stops, 
You're a child again, but still an adult. And not just a satisfied, pleasure-seeking hedonist either, but a participant in something shared." End quote. Beyond this nostalgic yearning for the past, Alice Waters and others in the new food movement who celebrated the sensual pleasure of delicious food wanted to reshape the future as well. Create lasting change in these values through her writing and through her institutional partnerships and by influencing a new generation's relationship to food through, in particular, the Edible Schoolyard Project, which she started in Berkeley in 1995. In the project, Waters sought to integrate the growing, preparing, and eating of food into the curriculum of schools, starting with a middle school in Berkeley, California, near her restaurant, and then it spread elsewhere. And the idea was to foster better health among the children, greater respect for food, and a connection to the natural world. So kids would build gardens like this and work them themselves and prepare the food. She also wanted wanted to encourage delight in wholesome food um, and having the kids share the food together. Waters established the Chez Panisse Foundation to provide financial support and stability for the project, and several affiliate gardens opened in other schools uh, far and wide. Other chefs also made their mark in the new food movement, recapturing the unadulterated flavors of fresh organic food and building relationships with farmers. And they also sought to create a legacy for the future. They too wanted to change attitudes about our relationship with the earth. But as Chef Dan Barber indicated, one had to overcome the idea that nostalgia and pleasure seeking were impractical. Barber, who was the, the chef owner of an exclusive restaurant in New York called Blue Hill, as well as a multi-purpose restaurant, farm, and education center upstate New York, began his memoir with the description of two seemingly contradictory urges. One, he told lovingly of his grandmother's farm where he spent childhood summers. And then he wrote about the skepticism with which he greeted one farmer's practice of planting corn, beans, and squash in a mutually nourishing patch using what was referred to as the Seven Sisters strategy of Native American planters. He judged the farmer's idea quaint, yet wrote, I had nothing against honoring agricultural traditions, but I didn't need a sisterhood of beneficial relationships. I needed polenta with phenomenal flavor. But come harvest time, he wrote, it was an awakening. His senses were overcome by the flavor of that particular corn. Quote, it was a polenta I hadn't imagined possible, so corny that breathing out after swallowing the first bite brought another rich shot of corn flavor. As did Waters, Barber happily embraced nostalgia and taste as mutually supportive, not competing goals in the food revolution. Moreover, Barber continued to celebrate the taste as the best way to evaluate environmental and human health. Quote, taste is a soothsayer, a truth teller, and it can be a guide in reimagining our food system and our diets from the ground up. Despite the assertions of Barber, of Waters, and others who embraced the new food systems, there were others who continued to argue that there was an inescapable tension between nostalgia for food from simple family farms and the pleasures of fresh food that was sometimes too expensive for everyone to enjoy. Critic Rebecca Solnit asserted that participants in the new food revolution had done little to bridge this gap. Food, she wrote, has become both an upscale fetish and a poor people's radical agenda. Her argument seemed reasonable, especially when one compared the choices available to a diner at Blue Hill 
and a poor resident of an inner city who might live in a so-called food desert far from a grocery store. Similarly, historian Rachel Loudon argued that in criticizing industrial food systems, modern food activists ignored the democratizing benefits of cheap, abundant food, which allowed people to spend less, less of their income on basic necessities. There were other examples of such class critiques. For example, a review of the first Chez Panisse cookbook from The Nation magazine seemed to drip with contempt for the betrayal of the counterculture at the elite restaurant. Aesthetics is the ruling term in its vocabulary. Life must be pretty. Understanding, philosophy, and ideology now apply only to the kitchen. New food enthusiasts were not always sensitive to such concerns. Barber, for example, unselfconsciously used the, the much derided language of 1980s American politics to explain to his readers that the food revolution, quote, trickles down from the white table restaurants to bistros and to everyday food culture. Elsewhere, Barber did answer such criticisms by pointing out rightly that industrial food was not really as inexpensive as some people believed. Since, for example, it relied on heavily subsidized petroleum at all stages of its production. Subsidized petroleum, as many others have pointed out along with Barber, was just one example of how many of the true costs of industrial agriculture, economic, political, health, environmental, were hidden or externalized, leaving many people to unthinkingly celebrate the abundance of apparently cheap food. Nevertheless, the zero-sum equation of practicality and hedonism was simplistic. Was pleasure in food only reserved for elites and the new food movements hopefully inefficient? How to address this class tension points us back to the fundamental question I raised at the outset, what to eat. Writer and food activist Wendell Berry provided one answer to critics who saw the new food movements as elitist. He asserted that pleasure was the measure of a healthy food system, not a mere indulgence. In his 1989 essay, The Pleasures of Eating, Barry asserted that taking pleasure in food was neither elitist nor selfish, but necessary. He asserted that food should be pleasurable for everyone. Quote, the pleasure of eating should be an extensive pleasure, not that of the mere gourmet. People who know the garden in which their vegetables have grown and know that the garden is healthy will remember the beauty of the growing plants, perhaps in the dewy first light of morning when gardens are at their best. Such a memory involved itself with the food and is one of the pleasures of eating. Thus, Barry found pleasure in local food and knowledge about the land from which it grew. In his call to find pleasure in the relationship between land and food, Barry also challenged another aspect of the industrial food system. He rejected the idea that the relationship to food was merely about consumption arguing that the food industry wanted people to be, quote, mere consumers, passive, uncritical, and dependent. As consumers, Barry wrote, people were unlikely to realize that, quote, the overriding concerns of the food industry are not quality and health, but volume and price. Instead, Barry argued people should not be content to be mere consumers. His view of pleasure both grand and spiritual, was nothing short of explaining the human connection to the natural world. He concludes, eating with the fullest pleasure, pleasure that is that does not depend on ignorance, is perhaps the profoundest enactment of our connection with the world.
In this pleasure, we experience and celebrate our dependence and our gratitude, for we are living from mystery, from creatures we did not make and powers we cannot comprehend. Beyond the environmental importance of pleasure, Michael Pollan further asserted that far from being elitist, good food was, quote, potentially one of the most democratic pleasures a society can offer, accessible to and appreciated by all classes and groups. In her recent memoir, Alice Waters also weighed in on the charge that pleasure was elitist. Along the way, she pointed out that pleasure was inextricably connected to beauty. Quote, we've been made to feel that beauty is expensive, that you can't afford it, that beautiful things are only for people who make a lot of money. Instead, she asserted that everyone could discern and experience the pleasures of beauty. That is, once they were educated to appreciate the world outside of what she called fast food culture. A related criticism of the new food movement and its adherence was that not only was it elitist, but that those involved yearned for a pure ideal food culture, either drawn from a mythical past or in slavish imitation of contemporary haute cuisine. In her playful celebration of aesthetically pleasing foods, blogger Adeline Waugh illustrated the rigidity of such yearnings. Waugh was one of the originators of a minor fad called unicorn food. Has anyone ever heard of unicorn food? Okay, a couple of you. Um, recognizable by rainbow colors, intermittent sparkles, and a fanciful sensibility akin to that of the mythical creature for which it was named. An essential part of unicorn food included documenting and sharing the image of the item in question over Instagram and other platforms, as these are taken from. Even Starbucks made its contribution to the fad with its sugary unicorn frappuccino available for just five days in April 2017. And there is the drink on the right. On first glance, unicorn food appeared to be a parody of both industrialized food and contemporary foodies encouraging selfish pleasure-seeking, and the consumption of food products loaded with empty calories, consumption of highly stylized foods made from processed convenience foods was a prominent characteristic of American industrial cuisine, especially in the middle of the 20th century. One of the classic uh, cookbooks of this food type was called the Can Opener Cookbook by Poppy Cannon. In it, she sought to glamorize home cuisine and the women who made it by using convenience foods. She encouraged the women who did, of course, almost all the home cooking, not to apologize for using convenience foods, but to have fun with them and to make aesthetically pleasing, creative, exotic concoctions. Creativity with industrial ingredients was her watchword. Thus, you can see how Adeline Waugh appeared to be a modern reincarnation and a critic of a chef such as Poppy Cannon. But on second glance, the story becomes more complicated. Aside from posting images of her unicorn creations, Waugh was a food stylist who also blogged about health and wellness. She had been experimenting with natural food dyes to make her food pictures more colorful, and the trend began to spread after her first posting. Her foods were all made from natural ingredients, unlike many sprinkle and marshmallow bedecked items later created by others. And her foods were intended to make nutritious foods more aesthetically pleasing and fun. And I I hope you could tell that there was a difference in the food pictures. So these are the natural wa ones, and these are the imitators later, which are clearly not 
from natural foods. For Wa, then, beauty and enjoyment were not guilty nor shallow pleasures, and they were not incompatible with healthy food. But Wa's creations, hearkening back to the highly processed foods of the 1950s, challenged the industrial food system on different terms. Her playful take on healthy food rejected artificial chemicals and encouraged people to eat wholesome foods which nourished their bodies. In a way, though, she was also issuing a challenge to healthy food purists who were appalled by rainbow-colored foods that looked artificial, even if they were not. Wa, as it turns out, also faced an angry backlash from some people after her Instagram postings because people were so outraged that she was encouraging these foods. Wa then was encouraging the enjoyment of food for aesthetic reasons, while at the same time indulging and upending nostalgia for industrial food. The backlash against unicorn food illustrated the point that not all aspects of a century of industrial food could be judged as failures, and that taking pleasure in food was certainly not shameful. Undeniably, another success of industrial food was the creation of abundance, which had allowed people the security to stop and consider the defects of the existing system and culture. As an example of this unique moment of abundance, writer Susan Allport considered the prolific number of deer near her home in Westchester, New York. What in other circumstances might be exploited as, quote, convenient packets of protein and fat for human consumption were often left undisturbed to feast on most of the edible plants around suburban houses. But of course, the blindness brought by abundance would not simply be repaired, uh, repaired by a wide scale return to deer hunting. As Allport noted, Quote, finding food had shaped our human selves and turned us into the people we are today. Allport's observation that many Americans blessed with abundance had no desire to eat the deer trampling their flower beds also gestured to an inescapable part of modern food culture, class. One cannot deny that what one ate was based in part on how much money one had to spend. And as many critics of the new food movement argued, it was easy to find examples of food that were used as a wasteful assertion of status by small groups of elites. Nevertheless, it made no sense to condemn the whole new food movement for the class pretensions of some. The new food movement in its various guises was a challenge to the existing industrial agricultural food system and a challenge to reimagine a new food culture. It called on Americans not to measure the success of the food system solely by the output efficiency and cost in terms of mass produced food. Quality mattered just as much as quantity. It called on Americans to recognize that food was not an industrial commodity, but an expression of culture and the human connection to the earth. It called on Americans grappling with the environmental challenges of the Anthropocene to affirm Wendell Berry's observation that, quote, eating was an agricultural act. And finally, it called on Americans to celebrate, not apologize, for the sensual pleasures of food. Thank you.